Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the lecture on multi-way cuts and hardness of approximation. My name is Rasmus Pei. Today we have two independent parts. First, I'm going to talk about multi-way cuts. We are going to see a two approximation by repeated cuts and a three half approximation using randomized rounding. In the second part, we are going to look at hardness of approximation results. First, we are going to see reductions from NP-hard problems and then we are going to have a look at fine-grained reductions. The K-wave cut problem is defined on an undirected weighted graph with non-negative weights. There are K-distinguished vertices named S1 through SK and the goal is to remove edges that disconnect these vertices from each other. So in other words, S1 through SK need to be in different connected components after removing these edges. We want to minimize the weight of the removed edges. In the example, we could remove these five edges and the three distinguished vertices would be disconnected. Suppose that F star is an optimal solution to the k weight cut problem. That is, it separates S1 through SK. Look at the corresponding connected component for each distinguished vertex. Obviously each edge of F star has at, at most two vertices, so it can touch at most two components. Also, the edges of F star that touch a particular component CI is a cut between SI and the other distinguished vertices. This suggests the following algorithm. So for i equal 1 to k, we compute a min cut, fi star, that separates si from the other distinguished vertices. This can be done in polynomial time. And finally, we output the union of all the, all the cuts. I would like you to pause and think. Why does this give an algorithm that is a two approximation to the optimum? To get a better approximation, we consider an integer programming formulation that we are going to address via LP rounding. In this formulation, we introduce decision variables xui that indicate whether a vertex u is part of the connected component ci, where S, si is present. Obviously, at most one of these can be set to 1. The objective is to minimize the sum of all the weights of edges that have endpoints in different components. We need to somehow formulate this as a linear objective function. The first try would be to say that this is simply the L1 difference between xu and xv, where xu is the k-dimensional vector indicating where u is present. The L1 distance is simply defined as the sum of absolute differences between the components. It's one if and only if they are in different components. In order to write this as a linear constraint, we use a trick you have also seen in the handins, which is to introduce an auxiliary variable that is larger than or equal to both xui minus xvi and uh, minus that. Okay. So this is going to have an optimal value, which is the absolute value. So we can simply replace the objective function by the sum or ci multiplied by this auxiliary variable set ei. So how do we round this? So we are going to end up with some vectors that make up an optimal linear programming formulation uh, solution. And the vectors corresponding to the distinguished vertices are must be standard basis vectors because the ith co coordinate is one and the sum of all coordinates is, is also one. Um, so intuitively what we want to do is if if u um, has a corresponding vector x u we want to put u in the connected component where xu is close to the vector xsi. Uh, 
simply assigning each vertex to the closest standard basis vector turns out not to work. Instead, we are going to do a stepwise greedy algorithm that starts by randomly shuffling the order of the distinguished vertices. So now assume that S1 through SK are in a, in a random order co compared to the input order. Now we're going to pick a threshold R in 0, 1 at random. And we are going to iterate through the distinguished vertices in this in the random order. So if there's a vertex that is unassigned and it is close to the ith uh, standard basis vector, uh, we are going to put it into component one. And here close means that a, the ith component is smaller than one minus r. So it's within distance r on the ith component. And then finally, in the kth iteration, we will put all the unassigned vertices in component k. So this is how we define the components. And finally, we return the set of edges with endpoints in different components. So we're going to get a component for each distinguished vertex, and there are some edges crossing it, and that's, that's, that's our solution. So let's look at a vector xu. So it's a vector where the sum of all the entries is, is 1. And yeah, the ith component is x ui. So if we draw the threshold 1 minus r here, we are going to assign u to the index i, that is the first one to cross or be above the threshold 1 minus r. Or if no such index exists, it's going to end up in component k. In order to analyze the randomized rounding algorithm, we write the expected cut value in the usual way as the sum over all edges of the weight times the probability that this edge is cut. Now I'm going to claim that this probability can be upper bounded by three quarters of the L1 distance between xu and xv for an edge u to v. So if we take this for granted, we are done. Why is that? Well, the L1 distance can be written in terms of the objective function of the linear program that we saw before, which again, bounds is a lower bound on the optimal value of the integer program. Let's look at how to analyze the probability that u and v are in the cut. So to that end, we consider the corresponding vectors xu and xv. And we can draw kind of the, the histogram of, of the k, k values. Let's define index L as the index with the largest value looking at both xu and xv. So there are no values above that. If 1 minus r is between the value of xu and xv on some coordinate, it may be that v is placed in the corresponding component, but u is not, or vice versa. It may also be the case that 1 minus r is smaller than both u and v. So in this case, for example, u both u and v are placed in C1 since they both exceed 1 minus r in the first component. Finally, it may be that 1 minus r is above everything. Then both u and v end up in the kth component and there is no cut. An important observation is that it's impossible that u and v are still not placed after visiting index number l and that one of them is placed at an index there but not the other one. This is simply because if 1 minus r is less than or equal to one of the components, it would have been placed already at step number l. So those indices that are after L can never cause a, a cut between U and V. So when we choose uh, or try to prove the claim, we only need to consider the cuts that happen, so to speak, before L or at L. <laughs> 
And we notice that we can only get into the cut if 1 minus i is, this in, in, is in this interval between xui and xvi for some i. And this has probability over the choice of r, that is the absolute value between the difference of xui and xvi. Also in expectation, half of the i's are going to be before L because we have a random permutation. So these are the main ingredients of the claim. Please see the book for, for details. And now for something completely different, hardness of approximation. In a usual NP-hardness proof, we take an instance of some NP-hard problem, let's call it P, and we translate it in polynomial time to an instance I prime of a target problem P prime, such that answers to P prime corresponds to answers to uh, P. This means that P prime must also be NP hard. Hardness of approximation proofs can be constructed in a, in a similar way. We start with an instance of an NP hard problem P, and in a pole time reduction, we translate it to an instance of an approximation problem P prime, such that for some threshold T, and for some approximation factor alpha, we have that if the answer to the original problem is yes, the answer to the p prime is less than t, and otherwise it's more than alpha times t. This is for minimization problems. So that is, we have a gap of a factor of alpha between the yes and the no instances. This means it must be np hard to approximate p prime within a factor better than alpha. Of course, the similar thing works for minimization problems. Let's look at some examples. The k-center problem that we looked at before and derived a true approximation algorithm, we would like to show hardness. We're going to start with an instance of dominating set. So the dominating set problem takes a graph, v, e, and asks if there exists a dominating set. So that's a subset of the vertices of some size k, which is an input, such that the vertices of s contain a neighbor for every vertex in the set V. So for every V in V, there now must be an adjacent vertex in S. So we reduce this to the case center problem by defining a distance function that is 1 if U and V are in the set and 2 otherwise. So we observe that this is defines a metric. Now the dominating set of size K if there such a thing exists, implies a k-center of radius 1, because everything will be within one distance 1 of one of the centers. And vice versa, if we have a k-center of radius 1, that corresponds exactly to a dominating set in the original problem. Of course, if the radius is 1, by definition of the distance function, uh, if distance 1 is not possible, it must be 2. So in other words, if we could at 1.99 approximate k-center, we would be able to distinguish between the case where a k-center of radius 1 and 2 exists, and hence a 1.99 approximation must be NP-hard to achieve. Next, we're going to look at the sa traveling salesperson problem, where we derived a 1.5 approximation for the metric case. We're going to show a hardness result for the general case, where we don't have a metric. We'll start with uh, an instance of the Hamilton path problem, which asks if there exists a closed cycle connecting all vertices, and does not visit a vertex twice. This is an NP-hard problem. To reduce this to an instance of traveling salesman, we said we define a distance function that is 1, for every edge in the set, and very large, let's say 2 to the n, otherwise. So 2 to the n here is chosen simply to be an n-bit number, so we can write in linear time. So remember that the reduction has to be polynomial time. Now there exists a, a Hamilton cycle, if and only if there is a TSP2 of length n. If there's no TSP2 of length n, the shortest possible length must use one of these long edges and have length at least 2 to the n. <clears throat> this means that approximating TSP up to a factor of 2 to the n over n is NP-hard. Here the factor 2 to the n is a little bit arbitrary. We could increase it to 2 to any polynomial in n. 
Next we look at bin packing. For bin packing we saw something that was almost an approximation scheme, but had an additive error. Let's show a hardness of approximation, for pure approximation. So we start with an instance of the partition problem, which, in which we are given n integers, and ask if it's possible to split the integers into two parts, where s is in one part, such that both parts contain exactly half of the sum. So in other words, the sum over all uh, b in b i in, in s must be half of the sum b. This is known in p-half problem. We can reduce it to bin packing by scaling a i to be 2 over b times b i. Now it's easy to see that we can pack these modified numbers into two bins of capacity 1, if and only if uh, the answer to the partition problem is, is yes. Of course, if it's not possible to pack into two bins, we must need three or more bins. So this means that if we could approximate bin packing within a factor of 4.999, we could solve the partition problem. So hence this problem must be NP-hard. Finally, I want to mention some famous in approximability results that we won't have time to show. The first one is for the max e three set problem, where we have a th three set instance and we want to approximate the number of clauses that can be satisfied. We saw that a random assignment satisfies a fraction seven over eight of all the clauses. Turns out that we cannot improve this even with a small epsilon larger than zero. There's a deep proof about this that goes via the so-called PGP theorem. They're also known in approximability results for max cut. Unless p is equal to np, it's known that max cut cannot be approximated within a factor of 16 over 17 which is not so far from the approximation factor that we saw using randomized rounding of 0 0.878. Also, this approximation factor, the upper bound, is known to be the best possible assuming that so-called unique games problem is, is hard. Unique games is a famous problem neither known to be NP or NP hard. It's connected to a lot of approximation problems. Finally, we are going to look at so-called fine-grained hardness results, which are not covered in the book because these are recent developments. But the idea here is to show hardness also for problems that are not NP-hard, but are in, in polynomial time. So many of the fine-grained results start with the so-called strong exponential time hypothesis, which says that the satisfiability problem uh, requires time 1.999 to the power n, where n is the number of variables in the set instance. And here 2 to the n is, is uh, the time bound for the, for the best known, but also the, the trivial algorithm for satisfiability that just tries all combinations. A related problem is the orthogonal vectors problem. So we're given two sets of size n of vectors of log n dimensions, binary vectors, and we need to determine if there exists a vector in pair x in A and y in B that have a dot product of zero. So that is, they don't share a one in any of the log n uh, dimensions. There's a trivial quadratic time algorithm that just tries all pairs. And it's known that an algorithm in, that is faster than that, so that, that runs in time O of n to the 1.999 would imply that S, the strong exponential time hypothesis is false. So in other words, assuming the strong exponential time hypothesis, it isn't possible to achieve such a, an algorithm for the orthogonal vectors problem. Now we're going to see an example of a fi fine-grained approximation hardness result. So we are going to assume that the orthogonal vectors problem is hard and show that this implies hardness of an approximation problem. So we start with the instance with sets A and B of the orthogonal vectors problem, and we want to create an instance of the so-called L-infinity closest pair problem, which is what we'll show hardness for. So this 
is given two d-dimensional vectors, x and y. And we want to ask what is the minimum distance between a vector in x and a vector in y, where we measure distance in terms of the L infinity distance, which is simply defined as the maximum coordinate wise distance. The reduction goes as follows. So we're going to create the set x from the set a from the OVP problem for each vector a in, in a we're going to define x a where the ith coordinate is either 1 if ai is equal to 1 or 1 third if ai is equal to 0 and the set y is defined from y, uh, from b in a, almost the same way if bi is is 1 we set it to 0 otherwise we set it to 2 thirds It's easy to confirm that the L infinity distance between x a and y b is either going to be 1. And this happens if there is a coordinate that where both a i and b i is 1. So in other words, if the dot part is greater than 0, otherwise it's going to be 1 third. So if there exists a pair with a dot part of 0, they have L infinity distance 1 third. Otherwise, all pairs have distance 1. That means that solving the closest pair problem within approximation factor, say 2.99, in time n to the 1.999 would imply solving the orthogonal vector problem in the same time bound.